uh, Stephen Sanofsky. Period. Oh, there. Hi there. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Stephen. So, um, I think a lot of people are curious about something uh, involving you personally, which is wh why did you, you know, ship Windows 8 and then leave Microsoft? It was time for a change. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of people here, and people, some people come up and go, 23 years in one place. How did you ever do that? Right. And a lot Plus of people. Plus Microsoft. They added the Microsoft part in Invisible. <laughs> you added that. Okay. Right. <laughs> I love Microsoft. I loved everything I did there, everything I had the opportunity. It was a, I loved the people, the leadership. Everything about it was great. But it was time for, to do something different. You know, a couple times in my my career, I, I took breaks. I took a sabbatical back in 1998, about nine years after I started to, uh, to teach. In 2004, we went and lived in China. And what I found was that learning and, and experiencing things from a different perspective was the most energizing and the most rewarding part of, of sort of growing just as a, a product person. And then you reach a point where you know, you really want a, a truly different perspective. And so I felt like I needed to separate and sort of not be the company guy. You know, even when I was away during those times, I was always the Microsoft guy away. And that's great. You know, I was proud to represent. But on the other hand, you know, you come with an agenda. I was talking to somebody last night who, who said, oh, that, you know, that agenda works both ways. Mm -hmm. Like, we think you have an agenda, and then you think you have an agenda. And we, you know, he was the CEO of a 100-person company. And, he said, yeah, we really couldn't have a conversation. And so that meant that the learning wasn't going to happen. So okay. when, you, when you ship the, this big thing, what was, what was your thinking going into that? That you wanted to finish this or problems at, within Microsoft? Or you feel like you couldn't do what you wanted to do next among those? What was your, what, no, it was just, you felt like you had to ship this thing and then move on? Right. And, you know, I actually do tons of blog posts internally for people about when's the right time to change jobs. And, you know, it's, it's actually really tricky because products, you know, they, they overlap. You know, you start working on the next one before you and you want a clean break so that everybody knows who's accountable and who's doing what. And so you just kind of, you have to pick a time. And so I picked a time. And so uh, I want to talk, and I know Kara wants to talk to you about broader, kind of the broader landscape, but there's a, just a, one, one other thing I think that people wonder about and would love your take on that goes back to the Microsoft uh, uh, period in your life, which is, which is Windows 8 itself. And uh, it's kind of a twofold question in my mind. One is, what went into, your, into the decision to write a tablet operating system with tablet full screen apps? and not restrict it purely to the tablet form factor hardware the way Apple uh, has done with some success, considerable <laughs> success, and, and um, instead to put it into every kind of PC uh, right along with your traditional Windows thing. That's, that's one thing. And then secondly, uh, what's your reaction to or, or analysis of what appears to be a slow uptake or a slow start to uh, Windows 8? Well, you know, in a sense, there, there, I, don't, I don't really want to revisit all of the, the discussion, the dialogue. I mean, one of the things that we tried really hard to do during the development of the product is be incredibly open and transparent. I mean, I, I got accused too often of writing blog posts or, or just writing the intro to a very long blog post that sort of went into the rationale and to the sort of the thesis behind why we chose to do what we did back when we were a we. And, and I think that, that those decisions are the decisions that we made as a team. I think that the team is moving forward. Today, you saw Microsoft talk about continuing the vision for, for Windows 8. And they're the, the people there, the people that built the product, and the best people to just keep that discussion going. Because it's, it's not a thing that just happens once and then ends. It's a, an, ongoing, an ongoing discussion about how the, the product evolves. The, the sales, you know, it's hard for me to look at selling a hundred million of something and not feeling great about it. So I sort of feel like, wow, that was a lot. Well, why do you, I mean, I think, follow up, the, the uptake has not been the same. I mean, it's, you, you, you're the person widely credited with coming in and saving the last, the last op operating system. 
And so this one is not quite the, what's happening maybe in a broader question in the market for right. Windows or wherever that it's not because you did get a lot of credit for saving the Vista crisis and yet this one is not having the same impact as that did. It, it, right, wasn't it supposed to like get the PC, the traditional form factor PC business out of its malaise and doesn't seem to have done that? I think that the, the interesting thing is just the broader dynamic okay. and, and the fact that the, you know, the, the industry is undergoing a tremendous amount of change. And, and I think that that's exciting and it means that there's a, an opportunity. And you know, the thing that happens when, when a big change is going on, I mean, it, it really is like a true sort of Thomas Kuhn paradigm shift that's going on. And, and all of a sudden, it seems like it's happening fast, but it's been evolving, and it doesn't change overnight. It, it will take a long time for, for things to, to play out. And it's exciting, but it means that while it's going on, it, you, you, can't, you have to resist the urge to sort of pick winners and losers and right and wrong and who's on top and stuff, because it will play out over many years. But things are just are very different. The, the types of, you know, you're, you're well, well known for calling the first Apple smartphones, you know, small computers or handheld computers. And, and so what's really happening is, is that the, the nature of the computer is, is undergoing a transformation. And the, the form factors is a way of expressing that, but also the underlying sort of architecture or capabilities. They're, they're becoming more mobile, and that's not a statement of a form factor. It's a statement sort of the underlying software architecture and how that works. So a simple feature like being able to you know, be, think your machine is turned off, but when you move from one place to another with the machine sort of off, but the wireless networks reconnect or you connect from Wi-Fi to 4G back to Wi-Fi, that's a, a very different paradigm than we historically thought of when you had a wire and, a, and even a laptop. Or, or just the way that, that uh, computers are evolving so that they're much more like a, a sealed case kind of device. And that's an interesting paradigm shift because at first, you know, there are a lot of people who make their living or who have their expertise or their sense of empowerment that comes from, you talked yesterday about having five slots. And, being, and there are people who, who value that tremendously. But in order for computing to reach sort of the next billion people, you can't have that kind of thing. It needs to be sealed a little bit more. Well, I think it was, wasn't it Apple that started, sort of started that on their laptops, sealing the battery in that they well, the, took the battery tremendous you know, crap for that, right? Yeah, well, the battery is one component, but lots of things are, are yeah, You can't are part get of in. It. It, I, I think of it a lot like I, I remember when, um, when I was 16 and I was going to get, you know, looking at cars and, and, you know, we were at the car dealership and my father, a product of American graffiti and, you know, Saturday afternoon car on blocks, changing oil, fixing things and proud of the customizations. We go to this, this the car dealer, my father asked them to open up the hood. And I'm like, why are we opening up the hood? And he's like, well, you're going to have to learn. And I'm like, I am not going to learn. I'm not in the shop class, Dad. That's other people. <laughs> and, and I just, I, you know, I remember that very vividly. And I remember my father sort of tasking me on, you, you need to know this stuff. This is part of owning a car means fixing a car. And to me, owning a car meant it works so I could go to the mall all day Saturday, not so I could fix the car all day Saturday. And I think that that's the kind of transformation that's happening in computing. Like, the more people use it, the less that people want to be able to do a bunch of things that actually turns out over time in the masses, you know, reduced battery life or brought on instabilities or security issues or things, you know, all these DLL conflicts or things like that. And, and so the next wave of computing is about bringing it to billions more people. So where does that put when you're creating a win Windows 8, when you're creating this this is a train, we've seen this train coming for a while. How difficult is to shift, and why, why wasn't the shift more dramatic within Microsoft, given you had a huge job there, but you, you didn't run the place, someone else did. How difficult was it to shift or change that dramatically? Is it just impossible, and so Microsoft didn't make this shift as fast as it should, and kept using words like, you, you, all the different phrasing where the PC was at the center of They're it? They're all PC. All PC, or what? Well, I, I Try to choose my words carefully right. to just say they're all computers, right. and and I right. and I think that the shift. I mean, 
There's two ways to I'm look at it. I'm just thinking what happens within a big organization where it's obvious what's coming. It's not like, oh, you have to decide winners and losers. Yeah. That, that was coming down the putt. I mean, it's like that train is headed right for you. How difficult it is to get out of the way after, when you see it from three miles away? Well, hopefully you don't want to just jump out of the way. You want to sort of jump with it and, right. and okay. move forward. And I, I think, you know, look, it's, the, it's why there's so much opportunity. Because if, if any organization can, can shift itself, and, you know, Microsoft has shown over you know, decades, its ability to, you know, go from, you know, languages to operating systems to apps to servers to cloud, all of these things are transitions that Microsoft had made or the internet, you know, and, and I, I think it, it's, it's really just sort of a, a classic management challenge of just, you know, you have an organization, you want to align them, you want to communicate and get a very, very large number of incredibly brilliant creative people all sort of heading in one direction and making a a joint and shared bet, and it's 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 essentially just a management challenge. It, it's very rarely like a shortage of ideas, and much more often just getting people on one path. So one of the other things that you did uh, that was uh, a break with Microsoft tradition was you headed up the effort and were very enthusiastically headed up the effort for Microsoft to create its own computers, hardware, hardware, software integrated. Devices. I just hold it up now because I like you it. You can hold it up. <laughs> it's okay. People come here and hold things I'm up. I'm doing this for, for Panos. That's right. fine. For Panos, uh, who was who the guy that runs, runs this and worked for Steven. Um, that's the Surface, uh, Surface RT, I would guess. Um, and there's a Surface Pro, so Microsoft makes two computers. You have a factory. I, I know you don't no longer speak for Microsoft, but I assume they'll make some other things maybe there. Can you walk us through why did you feel it was necessary or useful for Microsoft to make its own computer, and how much uh, uh, culture shock was there in the company or, diff or, or friction in getting them, uh, others at the company, including your superiors, around the idea that you ought to do this? Sure. Well, I don't want to, you know, kind of recast and replay the. It's, we'd like the, you to, but go ahead. I know you'd like okay. us to, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but I, I think that it, a, any organization. It, in today's world of technology, I mean, it's a fascinating dynamic where, you know, we lo people love to talk about, well, there's, there's hardware, there's software, there's cloud, there's mobile, and they're all sort of related. And what, what you're seeing in the industry overall is everybody's sort of in everybody else's business in some way or another. And that sort of co-opetition, which is, I think was an Andy Grove phrase from a very long time ago, is is now much broader than, than I, I think that anybody sort of thought it would become. And it's a, it's a natural outgrowth of, of sort of the business models today where, where where exactly any organization generates its revenue and its margin is, is different. And it means that there's more places where you can sort of offer what somebody else does for free or charge what somebody else doesn't charge for. And so all of that is just part of everybody who's a product-focused person trying to deliver a great experience. If, if the person at the end of a computer is using a service, using a cloud, using the hardware, and using the software that's embedded on the device or apps, you, and you want to do it well, everybody that makes all of those parts is looking to see which parts to make the most sense to deliver their view, their point of view. Why did it make sense for you to do uh, hardware after years of saying a, after that years wasn't. of not doing it. Well, I, I and think saying and not just not doing it, saying that wasn't the way to do it. Well, again, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I really don't want to revisit the sort of the yeah, specifics. Yeah, we're not, we're not I really. We, I know. I, I think this, this is, is not us trying to bait you into attacking Microsoft. No. Much fun as that would be, and it would be. <laughs> and please feel free. And, but but, but yeah. I'm 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 philosophically I'm just yeah. interested yeah. in. Well, what was the paradigm? Because it's an interesting shift. Because I think besides the sort of headlines where people say, oh, they've now taken the Apple way. What happened there? What was the? I mean, I think it's not it's a negative or positive. It's like it's a major shift in thinking. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it, it really is just what I, I said. It's about if when you sum up all of the parts of the ecosystems that are involved in all that, whether it's services or hardware, delivering a great experience sort of is about the connections between all of those and parts. And so having the same company do all those connections? As a... As uh, Tim Cook kept talking about the connections. Well, they're, they're very real. All the questions that were just earlier were about not like you know, this part of, of Chrome or this part of Android, but the connection of Android to this other part. Right. And, and that's a, an engineering thing. It's not some faked up, you know, 
esoteric partnership Synergy or it's it's like there are real people who have to sit in an office and write code to connect two things, and and I find that that hugely challenging and it's the fascinating part and and on top of all that you have to choose which things you're connecting and then you have to choose the APIs that are that you open up and in what level in the system and and at some point you're like wow there's it just gets too there's too much and so you'd rather try to focus and deliver one part at least through you know, one branch of the efforts you're trying. So can you assess the sort of broader landscape now? I want to talk about uh, not outside of Microsoft. What do you, who do you think is doing it right? What, do you, what are the parts that you think are important right now going forward? I mean, you thought a lot of this as a Microsoft executive, but you have a broader look at the, uh, the market. You, you carried a lot of Google products, Apple products, which at the time was not easy to do at Microsoft. Yeah. How do you look at a Google right now or an Apple? Could you sort okay, of set? Talk about both those. What do you think their strengths and weaknesses are? You're I'm a free man. I'm You're free. free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I do, I, part of me thinks that, I mean, like the, the one thing you can't lose sight of is, is the unbelievable amount of, of product, of quality, of features, of benefits that are being delivered at an incredible pace. I mean, sometimes all of us in this room sort of lose sight of just like the sheer amount of innovation that's that's appearing, and and that to me is is unbelievable. You know, and spending just time on you know in the valley, which I've been doing a bunch of, and just seeing companies and startups and new in the energy or watching. You know, I, actually, a great example is when, in 1998 when I taught, our class tried to create products. So imagine what it was like to create in 10 weeks a product from scratch. This is at the at Harvard. 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 We'd go over to MIT and find some technology in a lab. Like I remember colored LED lights were all the rage. And in 10 weeks, you could basically take the prototype that already existed and like sort of go to Kinko's and put stickers on it and make a box and try to sell it like risky business or something. And now... Um, I hadn't thought of that business. Okay. I, I know. But, but now, in 10 weeks, like we had 15 groups in, just in our section all go and make apps, make websites, and go from beginning to end and literally transact revenue from people who had nothing to do with Harvard. I mean, it, it, it's an, it was like one group created a whole app for, uh, believe it or not, arranged marriages in India. And through the, the, the app that they did on mobile platforms, the service that they ran, and then the services that they connected to for payment, they were actually collecting revenue from people in India in the span of 10 weeks. And so I, in comparing, I don't want to lose sight of just how, okay. how everybody right. So good foundation. Everybody's doing exciting so, things. So look, I, I but, think but, but, everything but, is magical and wonderful. But having, right? having, yes. having run yeah. Office, which, which could be a giant company itself, having run Windows, which could be a giant company itself, and being, I know you, I know that all, even when you were at Microsoft and it was difficult, you always tried to keep your mind open and learn about other people's products, which it seems natural to me, but there were moments when it seemed not to be the thing at Microsoft. And, um, and since then, of course, you know, people got all excited when they noticed you were uh, texting from an iPhone that, uh, shortly after you left. And, uh, yeah, I got the, what are those blue bubbles? Blue bubbles, the blue <laughs> bubbles, the iMessage bubbles. And then that became a little... But wait, I have, a, I have an Android phone Today now. you have your Android phone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're all HTC One users these days, I think. Yeah. So, um, so you are an analytical guy. You've run these big organizations. What are the kind of uh, uh, positives and challenges at Google and Apple? Well, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, for me, the using this Android phone has been, you know, it, it's amazing and it's in, in, in all the things that they say, it's amazing in its openness, it's amazing in the variety of OEMs, and you hit on the challenges that I think that they're, they're gonna have. I mean, the fact that you can find all these price points, the fact that you have brilliant hardware coming from multiple vendors, that they're able to customize it, it's all great, but then the seams, the, the software that duplicates things, you know, I, I mean, I, I, this, I'm, because of the duplicate, home screen thing, it actually thinks I'm in Portland, Maine right now, and I don't know why, and the web <laughs> doesn't know why, because when I ask the web, it all says, oh, that's just a thing, they all do that, and I'm like, really? Portland, Maine? We, we rigged the hotel. Yeah, and, well, it's not, so, it's not just the hotel, sometimes if I go outside, I'm okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I mean, I, I certainly had enough experience in that domain to know that those are hard challenges, and finding that balance, finding those extensibility points, and, and I also think that, a, you know, the, the design language 
shows that openness. So, you know, lots of list boxes and choices, you know, do you want to open your photo this way or that way and all of that. And then you, but the openness is there and that's a huge, huge asset because it means that there's an ecosystem of people who are betting their businesses on the success. And, and whether it's on hugely different form factors, sensors and all that, or just on, you know, four and a half inch smartphones, having many, many people can be part of your success is, is an incredibly powerful force multiplier. Mm -hmm. you, you, that, and that's a, a big part of, of Windows as well. You know, the Apple side, the, they are, the products, they, they're, it's beautiful to use a, an iPhone. And it's just as long as you do the things that are, it's optimized to do and use the things that, that it supports. But I, I also think that, you know, well articulated questions were asked, like, what about the services behind it? Are, is Apple going to do the services, integrate with the services? And the interesting thing from, a, from an engineering point of view is, is that if the experience of using a device is, is equivalent to the experience of using the services, then those seams, you need to remove the seams with the service. And I, I think that the way Apple did iMessage, which I don't think people gave enough credit to, is, is phenomenally good. I mean, the integration with iMessage and FaceTime you know, the way it's one address book, one sign, all of that, you know, it, it, it's really, really nice. And, but they have to innovate there because you look at something like WeChat and it's sending little voice messages or pictures or some mixture or of all of WhatsApp, those or yeah. WhatsApp. Well, they have to keep innovating. Otherwise, people will look at services from another place. But then those services have integration challenges, not, not in terms of like closed or open, but just like doing as good as well. a job for a person at the other end. Can they do that? Can they, are they Well, you able? can always do anything. Right. But there, and that was, I, I was fascinated by that, by the discussion about being more open or not. Because of course, no one is going to sit in this chair and say, we want to be closed. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a, that won't go over well. It's not, not a good thing. But it's the, the subtlety of being open it, it is hard to sometimes get across, which is you, you open something up and there are nefarious app developers out there. And they might not be like super evil, but they are looking for every edge over everybody else. So they might think they have a great calculator, but what they really, that they really want to make sure you see it. So they might put access to the calculator in every conceivable place in the, in the operating system that's allowed. And so you might be like um, reading a web page, share, and then calculator shows up. Mm -hmm. And you know, that would be perfectly legit. But that gaming of the system of APIs happens when you open something up. Even if you just intended to make you know, the leading social network be able to do something. Because the, the challenge with APIs is you can't, you can't pick and choose who gets to call them. And so you, it's, it's much more subtle than just well, And there's also different levels of open, right? I mean, Sundar referred to it, uh, and uh, one of the questioners r referred to it. Um, there's open Android, really open Android is used by a bunch of people in, I guess, China and some other places, and more notably, Amazon, where they say, OK, we take your word. It's really open Android, but we're building our whole stack on top of it. Right. It's not what you're building in Mountain View. And, and Sundar said, that's a great thing. That's, that's good variety. Um, and then there's uh, the, the, what you have to do if you want the Google Maps and Gmail and Google Search and all that and the Google Play Store, most importantly, you, you have to sign some kind of agreement. There are rules and terms. I'm not saying it, there's still not a lot of openness in there, but it's not purely open because you're, you're accepting some restrictions. Um, Microsoft, you didn't make things that were purely open in that sense, except just like Apple, uh, whether it's on the Mac or iOS, third parties can make, could make all kinds of apps on Windows, right? How many apps are, are there on Windows? I, actually, I have no idea. But I'm I mean, sure it's some number today. Maybe yeah. a million, I don't know, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, you know, or two, uh, you know, a lot. Um, so how important is it in your mind to exercise some set of rules or, or c controls? Well, you, you, I think that's part of this new paradigm is that the, the store for getting apps is another part of this paradigm because there, there's some level of customer promise that says when you go to the store to get something, you know, it meets some criteria. And all the stores have different criteria, different levels of it. But 
so there's the operating system openness, but then there's the customer part of it, which is, is where the apps come from and what promises do, do they make. And I, I think that this is all very, very sort of young in the evolution over, you know, because it, it seems reasonable, and I actually, of course, have no knowledge of any kind of thing, but that apps will, you know, today they use a lot of community-based ratings, a lot of counting on reviews, but it doesn't seem unreasonable that over time that there'll be more programmed versions of those kind of things, that people willing to commit to certain levels of functionality. It just seems like the kind of promise that customers are going to eventually want when it comes to sifting through, you know, millions of things. And, and that, but that kind of, of promise to customers that, that software does or doesn't do a certain thing is, is just as important as the promise to the, the uh, channel customers, the OEMs or the hardware partners to, you know, that you're open in certain ways and then there's a promise if we're going to open it, you're going to deliver it in some way. I mean, even whether or not device drivers have digital signatures and stuff was a very early version of that kind of, of promise. But you, have, so you had, you, in, in your, in the Windows group, you, you have a, had a store, have a store, there's a, there's a Windows uh, 8 store, it's also a Windows phone store, but that wasn't yours. Um, did, did, did you guys sit around and think about how much to curate that store, and where did you, where do you feel, where do you personally feel about it? Well, I think, I'm not going to talk about the past side right. of it, but I, no, I, I mean, I think going forward, all of the stores are, are, you know, you're looking at this this very challenging problem where you want to tell your customers you have an asset of, you know, a million apps, seven hundred thousand apps, five hundred thousand apps, but. You know, you, they, customers want some way to, to sift through it. You know, certainly the, the crowdsourcing of the reviews and the top rated, that level of curation is unbelievably helpful. But I, I think all people who do stores, whether they're for music and video or for, for apps, are all thinking about, well, there's got to be a, a, another level of, of customer assistance we can offer. But what's the right way to do that so it's not just a place where the, the, the wealthy suppliers can buy their way to the top and, and influence it that way? And what is the right, the right answer to that? And I think this is just the general internet problem. It's the homepage for, you know, it's the homepage for a content-driven site. It's the, the, a shopping site. It's what products to promote at the beginning. I mean, you know, what is, you know, how do recommendations work and all of that? And that it, I think we're just so early in all of this. And, and it's not, it's a general computing problem of, infinite data needs to distill down to a finite set that is programmed for me that might be relevant. So last question, because when we're going to get to audience questions, where do you want to work next? Would you go to Google if they offered you a job, or Apple, or is there, <laughs> have you been offered a job? Uh, but I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm, right now I'm really in learning mode. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm learning by teaching, I'm learning by writing, um, learning by hanging out in the valley and, you know, it, 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 like I don't, I mean, think of it this way, up in the Northwest and the woods, it's very, very tricky to understand what's going on in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the company guy agenda thing, and, and you know, folks have been unbelievably nice. Why, why is it so tricky? Is it just you can't get on a plane? What? Well, you get on a plane and then okay. you land and then everybody's like, do you want to buy our company? Do you want to help get the bid for our company raised up? Are you going to steal our secrets? Mm -hmm. You know, what, you know, and that, it's not, it's not unreasonable, and it, it just you. Just big companies here tend to integrate a little more. Is it? I, I haven't heard that as much, right, yeah. but I've heard the same problems from friends of mine. Yeah, at, absolutely. At other but companies. it's less. And, yeah. And and so I I am truly benefiting a lot by just sort of being this this. And and people are welcoming you. Oh, absolutely, you. absolutely. And and I and I'm learning a lot and working with small companies, medium companies, new companies. Um, the, some of the VC people, and it's been great. And so I'm, I'm not in a in a big rush. I you know, I do really believe like it's a sabbatical in the sense that I did in 1998 and 2004. And so I kind of just am looking forward to it. And Is there one big computing problem that you solved? Given you ran a rather large part one of one big computing, you know, big computing task that you'd like to get into. Not right now. Not this minute. My task is is definitely just broadening right now. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. Questions from the audience? Questions? Adam? Hi, hi, Stephen. Adam Lashinsky with Fortune Magazine. Where are you? Oh. Sorry, we're, there's a camera right between the two of us. Um, I thought it was fascinating what you just said about your reaction to l meeting more people in Silicon Valley since you left Microsoft. So given, if you would agree that Microsoft uh, missed a handful of technology transitions over the past 10 or 15 years, 
Do you think that Microsoft generally has a problem being in the flow of ideas in Silicon Valley because it's in uh, Seattle or for other reasons? Uh, no, I kind of wouldn't agree with the, the premise or the, the intro statement as much as it's just a general problem of being part of a giant organization anywhere and trying to integrate with other organizations. I mean, you, you come with an agenda. Like, it's not an evil agenda or a good agenda. It's just you have an agenda. And that is a, a challenge for any set of organizations. And I think large organizations hovering near small organizations is, is never genuinely a trusting relationship. It, it's a challenge. And I don't think it has anything to do with Microsoft or trends or anything. It's just org dynamics. Maybe, it's, maybe it is for geographic reasons, and, that, and that's what I'm asking you. Larry Page is very present in Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs was very present. Some of the other big leaders are around and Zuckerberg. networking in the valley. And Steve Ballmer is not, generally speaking. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if you think that's a, if that is a factor. You'd have to ask him. <laughs> He's not going to say anything. No. Uh, Stephen Fahad Khan, uh, founder of One Public. Uh, last year at Abu Dhabi Media Summit, I asked Bill Gates if he'd like to come back to Microsoft because it stands at the crossroad of being the leader in the next revolution. Uh, John Chambers yesterday alluded to the point that the next revolution in tech or productivity uh, gains are going to come from enterprise. And I tend to believe that Microsoft is probably one of the only companies positioned to take benefit of that change, regardless of what media and journalists um, you know, talk about Microsoft. Do you think that's true? That the enterprise, which part is true? Yeah, that, that Microsoft is still positioned well as compared to other um, competitors, although, you know, there's, there's a... In the, the enterprise. In the enterprise. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, I mean certainly, I, I've spent a bunch of time with really giant NGOs in Washington, D.C., and, you know, I mean, that is a, a core, one of Microsoft's core strengths is, is in the enterprise, and, and it's one that the, the enterprises embrace and like and value, and I, I think that is, is definitely, I would definitely agree with that. So, so Windows 8, you know, it's one of the most, you know, beautiful um, operating systems I have. I use my MacBook Air, and I have Windows 8 installed on that. So thank you for that awesome product. But do you think that product is going to grow really enormously in enterprise in a couple of years? It'll take more longer t period of time? Well, I, I think it'll follow. My guess is, is that any new product introduced follows a different adoption curve in the enterprise. And I think enterprises today are are looking at a, at a whole different world that's been a topic, an interesting topic of dialogue in, in, in the, certainly in the Chambers and Levy session about, about how enterprise IT is adjusting to a world where, where consumers can go and get devices and services you know, instantly and inexpensively that are really great. And how the enterprises interact with that is, is a super interesting question. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, uh, uh, Stephen Levy, Wired. Hi, Steve. Hi. Good session. Um, so now you're a learned professor, I want to ask you about uh, the innovator's <laughs> dilemma there. Uh, the big question is really whether these companies, which you know, are start out very innovative and build up legacies, can lead into the next realm of, of innovation there. And certainly, you know, in, in your career, you, you've, you've worked at a big company, uh, which certainly grapples with that, and we've seen other companies try to, you know, come to terms with that. And, and you know, now they read Clay Christensen's book, are determined to beat it. But, uh, you know, even a great company like Apple, we see, you know, is a little reluctant to switch the iPhone really quickly. And, you know, and, uh, and as, as companies build up, they design products with their legacy in mind there. Is this an, an inevitable sink there? Or can the innovator's dilemma be beaten? Well. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, this is the, the little mini department of Harvard Business School that I'm in is where Clay is and it's the, it is the place. So essentially it's a non-stop conversation about disruption in, in every industry for everything. And, and the, the whole challenge is, is in talking about it that, you know, business is, is a social science. It's not an actual science. And so you, you can't draw causal li lines very well. You can't really figure out a, an algorithm or a pattern. And so it's very easy to write the, it can never go that way, or it can always go that way kind of thing. And the only thing that's, a, that's true about, about um, that I think is true about the innovator's dilemma is, if you don't do anything, it will happen to you. Mm -hmm. And so companies have to do something when they recognize the, the shift that's going on, and they have to, to act. And 
and so, but then if you act, then you're part of the innovation that's going on and you're part of determining the, the outcome. It, and, and so that's the, the only thing you know, and there's just not, there'll never be enough data points because the contexts are completely different, you know, situation over situation to say, oh, well, they were 14 days late to this innovator's problem, so they're, they're toast. Or they got there the day of it happened, so they're in good shape. Because the other thing that's going on is, is that at any given moment in any industry, this, the conversation about disruption is happening, and you're, if you're a product person, your day is filled with this is going to disrupt you, that's going to disrupt you, this is the disruptive past. That, and product people have to make things, so you have, to, you have to sort of freeze the context a little bit for so, a long enough period of time to make a product and make a change. And then you, you freeze it, you do something, and if you are changing, then you, you get back in the market, you re-vector, and then you get feedback and you keep doing it. And you, you, that's what, what it means to respond to the potential of an innovator's dilemma problem. And that's not just all you can do, but that is what you're supposed to do. But, but okay, so now switch from professor as a veteran. When you were developing these products you know, that, that had these tremendous legacies, was that a, a, a burden or something that, that you could stand on the, the shoulders of? Did you feel constrained by it or empowered by it? Well, both. And what you, part of what the change is, is you look at the assets that you have, and then you decide which are assets in the new vector and which are not assets. And you, you focus down on the ones that are assets and you put in new stuff where you need new stuff. And, and that, you know, that's what you, you do. And you make a bunch of hard choices and a bunch of trade-offs and a bunch of good work and you just keep, you just keep moving. Because the only thing that's guaranteed is if you keep going in the direction you're going, then you're getting further away from everybody else is heading, or you, you uh, don't go anywhere and you just paralyze and you're like, oh my gosh, we're, we're going to be innovated dilemma to death. <laughs> that's a verb. It is. Believe me. <laughs> OK, over there. Uh, Mark Gurman, 9 to 5 Mac. Um, you know, Windows 8, um, which you are a big part of, and Windows Phone, they have this flat design aesthetic um, you know, with the lack of metaphors of physical objects and iOS, you know, it's been based on the schemorphic design for many years since its inception over five years ago. And it sounds like they're moving into the flat direction that, you know, your Windows 8 really pioneered. And so I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on flat versus schemorphic design in software, because it's really a big deal in terms of the user experience and how you feel about Apple and other companies potentially moving into that direction. Well, you know, I don't know any more or less than what I read that you write about what Apple is or isn't doing. Um, I, I'm just, I was excited about, about um, in any product that I've ever worked on, the opportunity to to be part of a product that changes the design language of, of something is, is incredibly exciting. And you know, Julie Green, who led the design of Windows 8, is just you know, one of the industry's best you know, product leader, design leader people. And, and she and people like Jensen and Sam have all done a, a fantastic job on, on the design. And it's just very exciting to be able to introduce that. And it's, it's also very challenging. Um, and it, you know, for whoever introduces a shift in the design language of their product, it's also a disruption and an innovator's challenge. And people build up an ecosystem around you know, graphical elements or paper-based advertising or banner ads that all try to model it. And so it's a, it can be a disruptive thing itself. And so as fun as it is, it's also a challenge. And so if people follow, that's even better. But design is a, a global cross-industry you know, discipline. And so when, when one part of an industry changes, it's usually reflected across a broad set of things like movie credits, you know, TV commercials, print, all of those will reflect, uh, you know, design language. And I, I think a lot of the, the design things that I've worked on, have, the, the people who led the design have usually reflected a, a global trend. Thank you. Hey, sorry, hey, one more question. Sorry, question. guys. Joanna. Hi, Joanna Stern from ABC News. My question kind of piggybacks on both of Steve and Mark's, which is disruption for the user, for the consumer. And Windows 8 had a lot of that. And I know you might not talk a little, uh, you might not talk at all about if Microsoft could have done more to make that change easier for users. But I mean, do you? And and then secondly, I mean, how can companies or should companies make it easier for the, the customers who use these products to make that disruption easier, to ease that disruption? Well, that, that is a, you know, anytime you change a product, you, you introduce that, that challenge if you have any installed base at all. And that is one of the, 
the biggest things that, that really it makes disruption yeah. sort of a challenge is yeah. if you have no market, no customers, then you're not disrupting anybody but all the other companies. And if you have a product with customers and you introduce something that's not exactly the same as the old one, by definition, you're going to disrupt them. And, and that's a balance that you, you, you face in anything you do, whether you're making a sequel to a Star Trek movie or a, anything. And, and so, you, you know, can you always do more? Well, after you, the product comes out, if it turns out that it was easier or harder, then you can do more or less and change it. And you, you just adapt. And that's part of, of what it means to do this. There, there's no magic answer, but you can't sort of A-B test your way to it because a billion people don't get your product until a billion people have your product. And so you, that's part of, you know, Tim Cook loved to say you, you make a set of choices and people are sort of paying you to make those choices. And that's so what- So you're just a, saying you just guessed? Um, no, I'm, I'm saying- I'm kidding. No, I'm not. I'm saying you use your product development intuition right. to, to do things. Because right. you, when you test a product, any product, not, not Windows 8, just, but any product before it's in market, the, the people who naturally go to use it will use it and push it the way that they push the old one. Eric Ries talks about this in Lean Startup. You know, you, you come out with a brand new product and you let some enthusiasts use it and, the, and then you just have to break from them okay. and redo it. And they're gonna get, a, those first hundred people are very upset, but you want a million people, not a hundred. Right. And to get a million, you're gonna do something different than, than that first hundred. And, and so all the pre-release testing in a world doesn't, necessarily help a product that's going in a different direction because the, the, the people just are there, they're the experts, the enthusiasts that like the old direction. That's why they signed up to pre-release it. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So Thank much. you.